Hello, good morning everyone and welcome to today's stream. Uh, it's already the last day of Club Cloud. We will be presenting from, uh, from Hilsum, but we also have a separate stream from Amsterdam. So please make sure to check out the website to see if there's inter something interesting for you uh, to see over there. Uh, today I would like to welcome Michel Sitman, our Cloud Financial Management Practice Lead, and Alexander Drakunov from AWS. Uh, he's a Senior uh, Partner Solution Architect, if I'm correct. That's correct. And uh, we were talking uh, for the CFM cluster, Cloud Financial Management cluster, and today we were talking about um, the best practices for optimizing costs and performance on your uh, your Microsoft workloads. So, Michel, can you please tell me why is it so important uh, this topic? Sure. So, first of all, good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining, and uh, well, pleasure to be here. Really glad that Alex uh, could make it. Uh, so, flying all the way from Sweden, so it's a pleasure to have you here. And um, yeah, it's it's a uh, it's easy. Uh, um, Microsoft uh, makes a big part of uh, what's being used in the cloud and uh, an even bigger part of what's being used outside the cloud. So the session today, we will explore a little, uh, a, a few things about that and uh, uh, understand the basics of uh, what makes this important and the really uh, cherry on top of everything is to learn how to, to optimize and how to prepare when you want to really be efficient using Microsoft workloads in the cloud on the AWS cloud, and and understanding that comes uh, uh, understanding since uh, what you look into uh, TCO uh, and and to to the cost of ownership. So you have these uh, really two big components about infrastructure and licenses, and licenses makes a big part of this uh, when it, we talk about uh, Microsoft workloads, and uh, when you talk about uh, SQL servers, everybody uses that, and uh, how how can you make this. Uh, uh, Efficient when you move to the cloud, there are some um, uh, really incredible uh, tips and uh, tricks uh, to, to and important points to really uh, check out and make sure you're ready to to do it. And once you do it, you are uh, going to be efficient in the cloud. And if you if you're already using it in the cloud, you can also apply those same uh, uh, or similar techniques to verify the, uh, that you are doing the the right things and uh, being optimized. So, yeah, so there's a big opportunity to optimize your cost, basically, uh, especially with with workloads which are connected to a license uh, at, at some point yes definitely that's that's the the, the key the key point so it's a, it's about uh, optimizing cost optimizing your environment and uh, not also for only from a cost perspective but perhaps also from a perform performance performance uh, perspective and this uh, also ultimately makes you uh, uh, an efficient machine yeah yeah thank you so Alexander can you tell me a little bit uh, why is it so important to do this with Microsoft workloads uh, so, because this is what we see uh, at the market now, so if we uh, get uh, results from uh, IDC research, so we see that uh, about 70% of enterprise applications were running on Windows. So this is like a huge amount of applications. And if you look at any enterprise customer, you will uh, see that they have like Windows workloads, they have SQL Server workloads. and also, what we see is that uh, customers are moving to the cloud. So these Windows and SQL Server workloads are moving to the cloud. And again, like according to IDC, in the uh, next uh, couple of years, like half of these workloads will be running in the cloud. So this is the uh, big opportunity for customers to move to the cloud and like to optimize what they move and like, how they move to the cloud. And this is what we're going to talk about today. Yeah, because there's also a big portfolio from Microsoft, right? Multiple products which are being used in, in the AWS yeah. cloud. Yeah, but uh, uh, our, the focus of today's session will be like mostly about Windows and SQL Server because this is what most of customers have in their portfolio. Yeah. So. Yeah. So uh, yeah, but please let let's get started. So with the with the first topic, <coughs> um, why is uh, again uh, why is Microsoft license why it's so important? You, you have a nice presentation around that. Uh, yeah. So before we dive deep into uh, some tips and tricks and best practices uh, for optimizing your workloads, it's uh, important to set the stage on Microsoft licensing. Yeah. So how Microsoft licensing works and how Microsoft licensing on AWS works. So what you need to consider. And again, why it's important is that if a customer uh, have well-defined strategy on Microsoft licensing. If customer knows like uh, how to use these licenses, how to be compliant when they bring these licenses, it can affect the total cost of ownership and uh, it can lower total cost of ownership. So that's why it's 
or increase if you do it or, yeah. Cor- you do, incorrectly. Yeah. Yeah. Is the, or increase. Is yeah. the two but, sides but of the same coin, right? Yes, but our goal is to uh, help customers to understand how to be compliant, how they can bring licenses so they lower total cost. So yeah. that's our goal. Yeah. yeah so, so, okay, tell me a little bit more about uh, how you can effectively use Microsoft license in AWS Cloud. Which different models are there? Yeah, so uh, basically there are two main models. So either you can buy uh, license-included instances from AWS, and we're talking about Windows Server and SQL Server, or you can bring your own licenses to AWS, which I will talk a bit later. So let's start with uh, license-included instances. So this is usually what uh, customers are start with because uh, so they just uh, so when we talk about the cloud uh, the well, one of the benefits of a cloud is that you can pay as you go so you use something you pay you, when we talk about like Windows and SQL you just pay per second for what you use and if you don't use it you don't pay for it so pure pay as you go model and uh, uh, when like before the before the cloud uh, uh, customers they have to provision the infrastructure for the peak loads. So the, I don't know, the most common example is I know, Black Friday. So okay, like you need to have enough resources to fulfill all the uh, requests for Black Friday, but the rest of the year it will be uh, a fraction uh, of that. Yeah, it will be a fraction that it will be not used. But uh, the thing here that the customers they don't pay attention to that. They don't only need to provision uh, hardware for this peak load. They also need to have enough licenses to cover this uh, peak load. So if you have your, I don't know, if you provision your SQL server for Black Friday, you have like really powerful machine. Maybe you have some, I know, read replicas for this SQL server, and all of them they have to be licensed for this peak load. But the rest of the year they stay idle, but you still pay for these licenses. And with uh, license included instances, okay, peak load, uh, uh, Black Friday is over, you can shut down these instances and you don't pay for these instances and you don't pay for these licenses. So this is one of the benefits. The second one is that uh, many customers, they, you know, they want to stay uh, compliant well, with their licenses and they don't want to deal with you know, this uh, enterprise agreements with Microsoft, uh, with upfront costs, so they want to focus on their business. And again, if they use license included instances, they they care about their business and we care about their licenses and they can be sure that they're compliant. So that's license included instances. So license included is basically the, 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 the easiest way to consume uh, Microsoft's uh, workloads in, in AWS. Yes, and it's pay as you go. You pay per second for what you use. So same as, com- I mean, same yeah. as compute. So for Black Friday, you configure your outscaling group, select the Windows AMIs, and have some metrics to scale on, and just go. Yeah, and th- this makes completely sense, and it's really aligned with uh, our own practice of uh, cost optimization in cloud. We always start with elasticity, and uh, it's even more important when you take these two perspectives, like uh, infrastructure and licensing. So the first thing is leverage elasticity. Make sure that you can use that, and if you're talking about, uh, uh, well, uh, something that is licensed in the cloud, and you have to consider these two uh, uh, costs, right? The licensing and the infrastructure. So go up and down uh, according to your demand, and uh, this is uh, exactly what we uh, uh, preach in, 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 in different words, uh, but it's completely apl- uh, applicable to this uh, situation as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And there's no long term commitment as well, so that's no, very easy. Exactly, pay as you go. For the long term commitments, I think we can skip to the the next uh, way of, of using Microsoft license to bring your own license. Uh, yeah, so uh, it's so uh, again we realized that a lot of customers were already made investment in Microsoft licenses, and uh, they have enterprise agreements and they have software assurance under this enterprise agreement, and they pay for it. So we don't want these customers to pay like twice for what they already have when they run this software on uh, AWS. So that's why these customers, they can bring licenses to AWS. And again, like there are two uh, ways on how they can bring it. So first, uh, if customers have uh, software assurance and uh, uh, under software assurance, they have this license mobility benefit. And uh, AWS is uh, 
offer us like a licensed mobility partner. So this means that if you have software with software assurance, then they can bring this software to Adobe uh, to default tenants or to dedicated tenancy uh, if they have like valid software assurance, which uh, uh, because most of our customers, they uh, they have enterprise agreements with Microsoft and uh, software assurance is required for first three years and after that they can prolong it if they want. But if they have active software assurance, they can bring software to either shared tenancy or dedicated tenancy to AWS. And, yeah. and can I bring any Microsoft license to, to AWS? Um, no, it's uh, not, not every license. So uh, you can, for example, to shared tenancy, you can bring SQL Server, and this is what most of customers bring. You can bring like SharePoint, Exchange, but yeah. Any flavor? Uh, what? Any flavor of SQL Server? Uh, so it's uh, standard edition, enterprise edition, web edition, so all, all of them are supported. And I will talk about developer edition as well later on. But also, uh, if you don't have software assurance, so, and for example, you bought licenses a long time ago, you have mm -hmm. these perpetual licenses. There is a way to bring these licenses to AWS as well, but you need to use uh, dedicated tenancy in this case. So you can bring the licenses without software assurance to dedicated tenancy, but also these licenses, they have to be bought before October 1st, 2019. So this is where licenses changes happened. But if you have a license which you bought before October 1st, 2019, and if you have uh, uh, dedicated hosts at AWS, and what dedicated host is, is that you buy like the whole server at AWS. So you pay per host per hour, but you as a customer, you control the placement of instances. So you can be sure that the instance that you provision it lands on this specific host that you point out. So yeah. that's... You can do some hardware pinning, basically. You do a hardware pinning, and that's why you have like visibility to hardware, to the cores, and yeah, this is called dedicated host, and then you can bring licenses to this dedicated tenancy. And do you have any recommendations on which type of license to use? Bring your own license versus license included? It's um, like you don't need to choose one. So it can be a mixed approach. So if you have a stable, predictable workload, bringing your own license could be more beneficial, especially on dedicated hosts. And I will talk why later on, because like in dedicated host, you have visibility into physical cores. So you can license by physical cores and not by virtual cores. So that's why having bringing your own licenses to dedicated hosts for stable workloads, it's, it's good. But if you have uh, spiky workloads, then uh, probably license included will be more beneficial in this case. Yeah. And another nuance on that is also uh, when to use what can can be a factor if you have a good planning, if you're uh, really planning your migration, uh, you you would have, and this uh, we see that a lot, right? That uh, 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 sometimes this uh, Microsoft, the licensing side of things are really controlled by uh, perhaps even by uh, IT procurement and not from the people organizing the migration to to the, the to the public cloud, and and. This is disconnected, but in an sit ideal situation, when you have a good planning, if you have made a big investment on licenses recently, then it, it might work uh, for in the beginning of your migration to 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 choose uh, uh, for dedicated hosts, where you could use the 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 licenses you you just invest a lot of money for a three year period, and it's just one year uh, since then. Then you, you still have two years. What are you going to do? You're going to throw away that investment to use uh, uh, pay as you go just because you can use that? So if you have a good planning, you will know what to, uh, how, to, how to better uh, uh, balance this, uh, this uh, already made investment with uh, or the flexibility that the, the, the pay as you go uh, licensing, can, uh, licensing included would, 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 ban would give you. So uh, it's a slightly different nuance. It's not only uh, uh, steady or not steady workloads. It can also be some uh, uh, come from, from need and investments made in the past. But it shouldn't be a blocker for you to go. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's basically uh, the, the consultancy answer. It depends on on your situation, situation yes. on yeah. the timing, on, on, on basically everything. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but this is something you need to uh, study before you do the migration. What licenses do you have? 
when do you have uh, enterprise agreement expiring? Uh, what are your long-term plans? I mean, are you still want to continue to use uh, SQL Server or you want to move to some uh, cloud-native databases? So these are different factors you need to take into account when you plan your migration. Is, is it difficult to switch from one type of license to another? No, I mean, it, it's easy to switch from bring your own license to license included. Yeah. So it's just a call like in uh, AWS console or like API call, like how it, you do it. But I mean, vice versa, I mean, uh, for bringing your own license, I mean, you need to fill a special form like on our website, which is sent to Microsoft so uh, to see, to confirm that you are compliant. So it requires a bit of preparation uh, before you actually migrate your... Yeah. your so previously we talked about uh, the, the, the operating system, uh, Windows, um, but the other product is a SQL Server. It's quite an, a big one, right? It's a, it's a big one, and yeah, so let's talk about SQL Server specifically. So uh, why we're talking about SQL Server? Because uh, first, it's the most common product that uh, customers are bringing to AWS as bring their own license. And also, it's one of the most expensive licenses that Microsoft have. So if you, for example, take a look at uh, uh, R5 4x large instance, which has 16 vCPUs, then uh, if you go just to price and calculator and see the cost of uh, EC2 instance with Windows, and then if you check, see the cost of uh, EC2 win instance with Windows with SQL Server on top of it, then you will see that the cost of license is like 75% of the cost of this instance. So like this is the area where you want to optimize your cost. And this is what I'm going to talk about, some tips and tricks and best practices on how you can do it. Yeah, yeah. And especially when you are looking at the, well, let's say the enterprise editions, for example, then, then it's yeah. the difference between the infrastructure cost and the license cost is even yeah. bigger. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so uh, first tip is to optimize CPUs. So what is uh, optimized CPU? So first, uh, if you have your, for example, you have your SQL Server and you have a requirement, like your SQL Server performs best if it has like, you know, 128 gigabytes of memory. Because uh, usually SQL Server is, uh, yeah, it's like, uh, it requires a lot of memory, not that much CPUs. So, okay, like you have your instance which requires this 128 gigabytes of memory and you will usually land it on uh, four extra large instance which has like 16 CPUs. And sometimes uh, your workload will require all 16 CPUs, but in many cases which we see, it will uh, use all this memory, but it will require like half of CPUs. So if you see the uh, load pattern, you will see that uh, you know, only half of CPUs are utilized. So this means that your EC2 instance is 50% uh, utilized on the CPU, but still you need to pay for the license for all these cores. And, uh, but this license is just idle, so it's not used. And does it also double when you're going to a multi-AC uh, setup, for example? Yeah, so, I mean, because SQL Server is licensed per core, so like, uh, de depending on how many cores you have, you have to pay the license, like, proportionally. So also the standby uh, so pieces? It, yeah, so if you have your secondary instance, I mean, you just pay double price for the. But again, I will talk about it later, how you can yeah. optimize it. But when you talk to optimize CPU, so this is the feature uh, of EC2. So when you launch your EC2 instance, you can specify how many cores are visible to the operating system. So you can say, okay, I want to disable hyperthreading. Okay, I want, instead of uh, 16 vCPUs, I want only eight vCPUs to be visible to operating system. And in this case, uh, you will only need to bring eight cores of SQL Server license to this instance. So it will not affect pricing for the instance because it will be like same instance. It will not affect the pricing of uh, Windows on this instance, but it will affect number of SQL Server cores that you have to bring in order to be compliant. So this is optimized CPU. So the next uh, optimization tip, it's, uh, it's uh, consolidate small SQL workloads. So what, is, what it means is that 
uh, when you license SQL Server, you license like in uh, four vCPU batches. So even if your instance has like one vCPU or two vCPUs, still you need to pay licenses for four, four vCPUs. So if you have if you have like two instances which uh, from performance perspective requires like two vCPUs, then it's better to consolidate them to have like one instance which has like four vCPUs, so you will have same performance like from uh, performance perspective, but you will pay for four licenses only instead of paying for eight because it's four minimum per instance. Uh, next, uh, as we already dis discussed, uh, consider using dedicated hosts because dedicated hosts, they give you visibility into physical cores. So, for example, if we have uh, R5 dedicated host, it has uh, 48 uh, uh, physical cores and uh, it has 96 vCPUs because of hyperthreading. So, if you use dedicated hosts, you can license uh, these 48 physical cores. But if you run like same workloads on a shared tenancy, you will need to license 96 vCPUs. So you have like to pay double for licensing. So if you have like enough workloads to fill this dedicated host, like consider yeah. using them. Yeah, that's important. So you need a, prop a certain skill to be able to, to leverage the, uh, the benefits of the dedicated host. Yeah, and yeah. again, I'm, I'm, I'm giving you like the best practices and some ticks you need to take into account when you plan your migration. Yeah. There will be ways to forget this. That, that's basically the message. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's important to, to uh, I like that, uh, how you put it, when you plan your migration, because th this implies in a way that uh, this comes since the architectural uh, uh, design, right, of your uh, solution. So it doesn't mean that because you're running uh, uh, exactly one thing on-prem that you have to do exactly uh, like it is there in the cloud, so that, uh, but if you don't take that step then, it becomes perhaps re really harder to change it later. Uh, it might not be exactly the, the situation, but it's, it, the important part is uh, the architecture. It's, it's since then, it, so it's uh, cost optimization and uh, uh, architecture are really, really, uh, uh, they, they, they go hand in hand. It's, it's impossible to, to make mm -hmm. a, a distinction in, in that. It's, uh, it, it's just another use case that we see this happening. Yeah. Okay, so next tip is a SQL Server passive follower that you already mentioned. So you have your active uh, SQL Server instance and you have your passive SQL Server instance uh, for failover if primary instance fails. So from starting from SQL Server 2014, if you have active software assurance, then you don't need to pay for SQL Server license on a passive instance. So you only need to license the active one. So still you need to pay like for compute on the passive instance, for Windows license on compute on the passive instance, but you need to pay, don't need to pay for SQL Server license on the passive instance. But again, I want to emphasize that you need to have uh, active software assurance in order to have this benefit. And again, this is something you need to uh, like the customers need to consider when we look at the estate. Okay, I have these two instances, but in reality, this is the active one, this is the passive one. So when we do migration, when can use this passive failover benefit? So again, this is how you assess what you have on premise when you do migration. Okay, uh, next tip is uh, step down the SQL Server Edition from uh, Enterprise to Standard, because the cost of Enterprise Edition is much higher than cost of SQL Server Standard Edition. So uh, you need to talk to customer to really understand like how the, like what enterprise features are used. So if it's only used for high availability, okay, like uh, uh, if they don't use it for read relay replicas, for example, then they can step down to standard edition and instead of uh, all of the zone availability groups, they can use failover cluster instances using FSx, for example. And they can lower the cost on the license like significantly when they switch from enterprise edition to standard edition. So again, like talk, I mean, talk to the customers and try to understand, do they really need enterprise edition? Like how it's used, what features of enterprise edition are used? 
and if not, then they can step down to standard edition and save costs. I go even further. I would say, uh, from our perspective, of course, as a vendor and a, and a consulting partner, we, we would talk to our customers. But even if you are uh, uh, the architect within your organization, go talk to, to, to reach out to the business and understand what is the real business need of your organization. Do you? We, we are pay, hey folks, we are paying for this. Do we really need that? Uh, uh, functionality or doesn't make uh, uh, doesn't generate any business output for us, and then we can architect this in a different way, and then mm -hmm. this uh, take take this uh, responsibility, the ownership to yourself. If you even if you're not, uh, uh, you don't need to necessarily consult with someone to 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 take this to to get this mm -hmm. accountability. Yeah, and uh, next topic is uh, uh, disaster recovery. So I already mentioned that you have this. Uh, passive failover benefit. So you have your active instance, you have your passive instance, but what if you have also disaster recovery requirement? So what if you need like one more instance in like different region for just for disaster recovery purposes? And like passive failover benefit will not cover this secondary instance. But for disaster recovery, you can just use like blo block replication. And uh, again, when you architect your disaster recovery solution, consider using block replication for this disaster recovery instance. So you don't need to pay for the license on that instance, just do replication on your storage level. Uh, then uh, uh, two more things about SQL Server. Uh, first, uh, SQL Server Developer Edition, you can bring it to either dedicated tenancy or to share tenancy. So if you have non-production workloads, for developers, for testing purposes, then you can use SQL Server Developer Edition, which is free, so you don't need to pay for any licenses. So again, like when you assess the customer environment, just check like what kind of, how, how different servers are used. And if a server mm -hmm. is not used in production, consider using SQL Server Developer Edition. And the last, uh, topic like on SQL Server is that uh, you can run SQL Server on Linux. So still you will uh, pay for SQL Server licenses, but you can eliminate the cost of uh, underlying Windows servers. So again, if your workload is dependent on SQL Server, you want to continue to run SQL Server as before, consider running SQL Server on Linux and save costs on And it's fully Linux. compatible, right? Uh, not 100%, but I mean, it's nearly on pair. Again, like you need to see what exact features are using, for example, I have access to file system and yeah, but they're more or less on pair. Yeah, yeah so, so, so we skip to the, the, the next topic, the, the, the operating system. Yep, so we talked a lot about uh, SQL Server, but now I will talk a bit about compute optimization. So uh, what is compute optimization? So uh, you have your workload and you want to get, I mean, you want to configure computer networking storage for this workload so that you achieve like your desired performance level at the lowest possible cost. So this is how you do compute optimization. And we have some uh, uh, tips, some instances for you to consider when you do this optimization. So uh, first I want to talk about storage. So we recently introduced uh, GP3 volumes on EBS on Elastic Block Store. So before, uh, and in AWS, like storage is independent from compute. So you provision uh, storage independently and then it's uh, accessed by network. So uh, this uh, GP3 Storage is a new generation of our general purpose SSD storage. And what's the difference with GP2? That with uh, GP2, uh, in order to get like higher throughput and uh, higher IOPS, you need to provision like larger disks. So uh, GP2 has a maximum of uh, 16,000 IOPS, but in order to achieve 60,000 IOPS, you need to provision like more than five terabytes of storage. And uh, beginning uh, or oh, end of last year, we introduced GP3 volumes. So this is where you can 
uh, provision uh, throughput and IOPS independently of a size. So uh, you get uh, the baseline performance, but if you need like more throughput or more IOPS, you can just provision it without uh, increasing the size of the volume. And also with GP3 volumes, they come at lower cost, like 20% lower cost. So again, consider using these GP3 volumes for your workload. So at, at a baseline, you, you, you come off the shelf with a better performance and a 20% better price. Exactly. So it's, a, it's, a it's, a no, it's a no brainer. No brainer. It's not almost, it, it is a no brainer. Yeah. One caveat here is that, for example, RDS is not supporting GP3 volumes yet. So we are talking about EC2 instances. Yeah, absolutely. But still, if you can use GP3, use GP3. And you can uh, switch from GP2 to GP3 without even uh, stopping your instances. Yeah, there is no be, downtime. Yeah, yes. Yeah. With no so downtime. it's also something to reconsider if you are already running on AWS. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So just uh, check what, uh, and you can use our compute optimizer to see uh, what you have. Because uh, compute optimizer nowadays also takes into account the uh, storage yeah. you have. Yeah. So it will recommend you switching Use from GP2 to, yes. to GP3. So. Okay, then uh, some of our instances, they have uh, instance store. So this is directly attached storage to the instances. And you can use it when you, we talk about, and uh, uh, you cannot choose the size of it. So like the size of instance store, it depends on the size of uh, underlying EC2 instance, but you can use this, uh, ins uh, you can use EC2 instances with uh, instance store for SQL Server and SQL Server will uh, benefit by having tem TempDB on the instance store or you can use uh, this instance store as a, a buffer cache uh, extension. So again, if your SQL Server is running on this kind of instance, I mean, it will get better performance. Then uh, we so we have uh, standard instances like C family, M family, R family, T family. So C is compute optimized, so it has like one to two ratio between uh, vCPUs and memory. M is uh, general purpose, one to four. Then we have R family, which is one to eight ratio between compute and uh, between vCPUs and the memory. But we also have uh, specific instances, which I want to mention now. For example, Z1D. So Z1D, it's uh, the instance we ha which has uh, sustained like four gigahertz speed per vCPU. So if you want to have like maximum performance per core, then you can use with Z1D instances. And when we talk about SQL Server again, uh, if you have like maximum performance per core, then you can use less cores meaning that you pay less for the licenses. So consider using this Z1D. Also, we have uh, X1E, high memory instances. So these instances, they have a really a lot of memory. So it starts with like four VCPUs and 122 gigabytes of memory, and it ends up with an instance with uh, nearly four terabytes of memory. And if you take into account this uh, optimized CPU, which I was talking about. So you can have instance with four vCPUs and nearly four terabytes of memory. So if you need a lot of memory, then consider using these instances. So right sizing, it's a, a, a fundamental part of uh, making sure you're, you, you're yeah. uh, leveraging uh, uh, and optimizing also for cost, not only performance, but also for cost. Yeah, we yeah. have plenty of options on, on AWS. I would like to, to go to the, the next part, the, the, the OLA part. Uh, what is OLA exactly? Okay, so uh, OLA, it uh, stands for Optimization and Licensing Assessment. So this is, uh, it's a framework which has both tools and like expert advisors on how you can, uh, yeah, how you can migrate your workloads to AWS. So it has like three main stages. So you need to uh, gather data. So you need to understand how, uh, like what you have on premises and how it's really utilized. I mean, not what kind of uh, server you have on premise, but how a server is used, how much memory is utilized, how much CPU is utilized, how much disk is utilized. So you need to gather all this kind of data. 
then uh, also you need to understand your uh, licensing. So, okay, like what licenses you already have? Can you bring like any of these licenses to AWS? So you gather all this data. And uh, you can do it with tools. So we have uh, AWS tools like Migration Ablator, or we have third party tools like CloudMise. So you use these tools to gather this data from on premise instances. Or if customers are not comfortable to install in this third party tool in the environment, they can ingest, you know, flat file with this information. So if they know all these details about utilization, so then they can just yeah, provide yeah. it as a flat We know file. it's, it's uh, really highly recommended to, to leverage the tooling and uh, automate this process. It's, it's, a, it's, yeah. a, it's, a, it's about a, at least a two week uh, a gathering data, right? So you understand really the, the patterns about usage and, uh, and performance you need. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then like once you gather this data, uh, the tools will help you to on analyze this data and uh, model the, how the same environment will look like on AWS, but uh, they will model it in a right-sized way and they will model it like in a uh, right licensed way. So uh, the tooling will recommend you the optimized CPUs, like how many licenses you actually need for these specific instances, how much memory you need for these instances, uh, and based on the, all the data that was gathered. And also this is where uh, you can uh, even further optimize it based on your expert knowledge. So you get all the input from this tool, you get the recommendations from the tool, but you can further optimize. Okay, I have these two servers and this one is uh, you know active, this one is passive, okay, I can even further optimize by using this uh, passive failover benefit or or doing consolidation of, uh, of uh, low CPU usage, right, in the same instance. And yeah, so. or if you have like really huge environment, okay, how I can pack these instances on dedicated hosts, for example, if I have licenses which I can bring. So there are very different ways which experts can, yeah, can help you with. And then based on what you gathered, based on all of these uh, recommendations from a tool, from uh, the experts, you build a plan like how you do migration, what can be my migration waves, like how the applications are connected together, and build a plan and yeah, do the migration. <laughs> yeah, then and, and where would you typically start? Uh, if I'm a customer, I want to move my, my workloads to AWS. Uh, where would you typically start uh, your your first journey to optimize costs? Uh, so uh, you, you start with optimization license assessment and this is something that we offer for customers for free so they can either uh, go to our website and just fill the form okay and then we will help them to do it or our partners can help our customers to do it and again it will be at no cost for customers it's good to have some uh, to bring in some experience, right? In this uh, this track, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, yeah, can be very difficult to because you are gathering a lot of of metrics, and then you have to find the right metrics and to, in order to uh, to make the right decisions. Uh, and then there are some caveats that uh, you you or pitfalls you want to avoid, and uh, m m make sure that you are thinking on 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 these nuances that uh, uh, are ex uh, expertly explained today during the whole session. So there's, it's a lot, right? It's a lot of information, but mm -hmm. it's really helpful and it's really important that uh, people have this in mind and create this awareness of uh, understanding that uh, you can really be optimized running in Microsoft workloads. Yeah, and, and do you have also recommendations? So what would you do first? Optimize uh, what you can do in, in on-prem and then move to AWS or first move to AWS and then optimize? Uh, again, it's, it's both. So, but we would say that uh, you start with cost optimization even before migration. So you do the OLA, you see what is the right sized and the right, how the right sized and right license environment on AWS looks like. You do the migration, but then you can do further optimization. And especially for SQL Server workloads. Okay, like you identify your baseline performance and then you can experiment with different kind of specific instances which I already mentioned based on your memory requirements, based maybe your, on your IOPS requirements, you can even further optimize once you work. It is an ongoing process, right? Yeah, it's ongoing process. 
Yeah. And maybe depending on your long term strategy, I mean, maybe you want to, uh, after migration, you want to modernize your workloads to cloud native options, to cloud native databases. So, again, this is like the v v valid path to even further save the costs. Yeah, and, and if I want to read more about this topic, where should I should I start? Yeah, so uh, there is a link uh, that y you can go. Uh, so again, as I said, uh, OLA, you can get it from AWS for free, or you can get it from our partners uh, for free. Just you know, fill the form, and uh, yeah, we will contact you and help you to do OLA. So like, you know what you have, and you know like how how you can bring it to AWS. So it will be right sized, right license, so you can save the cost. And you can uh, we have like white paper, so if you interested in more details you can read about it yeah reach out to us uh, <clears throat> we have uh, helped uh, many customers uh, move in and optimize uh, on the AWS cloud uh, with Microsoft workloads in general and uh, reach out to us even if uh, your uh, questions are not in the uh, the ebook or the available material our contacts are here so uh, thank you everyone uh, for my part it was a pleasure to be here thank you so much Alex it was a uh, really great uh, listening from you uh, face to face, but also from our audience, I, yeah. I'm sure. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah, with this, I want to close this session. Thanks both for having uh, you here. Um, thanks audience for listening, uh, watching.